Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, my name is Cheryl Lacoste. I am with uh, Fisheries and Oceans at the Pacific Science Enterprise Center. Um, I'm a section head in a different group that Kyle is from, um, but Marielle and I sort of have been trying to co-host this over the last few years as a bit of a replacement for the Salish Sea Roundtable that we have not quite figured out how to bring back. So this is a great um, way for us to share with our, our friends and, and scientists across the border. Lots of interesting topics that we've covered in the last uh, I don't know, six or seven ones have been such a huge range of diversity, but climate change seems to be one of those that are our friend center for us and our and our friends across the border. So I'll just jump in with the, um, it is uh, October 1st today, so the day after our Truth and Reconciliation um, for those of us uh, in Canada. So it's a day to acknowledge the, um, the residential schools and our path forward for being more inclusive as Canadians to recognizing the, <clears throat> the harm that was done to our uh, Indigenous friends and families. Um, so we, Kyle and I are both located at the Pacific Science Enterprise Center, which is on the unceded territories of our Coast Salish people, which include the Squamish, Musqueam and Tsleil-Waututh. Uh, this place was traditionally known as Stoopdale, which um, was is loosely translated into stinky place <laughs> and, and we believe that was because of its proximity to Cypress Creek with its abundant salmon returns that used to um, slowly decay on the small river delta there. So um, just give yourself some time to think about what um, Truth and Reconciliation Day meant to you yesterday and thank you for joining us here today. Um, so I'm excited to present Dr. Kyle Wellband. He'll be speaking with us today. Um, Kyle, uh, his undergraduate work was in Mount Allison, and then he spent several years at the University of Windsor working on his, his PhD and his master's. His PhD focused on genetic diversity in the success of biological invasions. So what that importance of that genetic genetic diversity to the persistence of those populations and species. Um, he has joined the Department of Fisheries and Oceans in the Genomics and Biotechnology Group in 2021. And his work today is gonna talk about approaches and results and some projects um, assessing the adaptive potential of Chinook salmon populations from a genetics genomics um, point of view. So with that, we will just welcome Dr. Wellben so we can maximize time for his presentation and Q&A at the end. So thank you, Kyle, welcome. Great, right, thanks, thanks, Cher. Um, before I launch into this, you can see my, my slides all right. I just muted myself, but yes, we can see your slides. <laughs> yes, <laughs> thank you. <you're> Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very much. No, that's good. Better better than just looking like a goof as I just start going and nobody has any idea what I'm talking about. Um, thanks thanks for the nice introduction. Um, thank you all for being here today for your interest in in this talk. And um, I must confess, this the, the what I'm talking about today is a little bit removed from, from what my day job is here at, at Fisheries and Oceans. I'm principally lead a, a group that, that does um, research on genetically engineered critters. Um, and so while that's my sort of main focus, this the, the work I'm presenting today is, is stuff that I that I also get to be involved in um, that's a little bit closer to my my passion, if you will, or my interest. Um, and so I'm, I'm pretty excited to be able to, to talk about some of the, the ongoing work that we're, we have trying to use genomics to predict um, the, the responses of salmon to, to climate change. Um, so I'm not going to take time to, to acknowledge uh, co-authors at, at this point, but I'm going to highlight them as, as we go through. I'm, I'm not alone in, in my efforts here. Um, there's a there's a big team that, that contributes to the stuff I'm going to talk about today. So um, get myself back into. Fun. Slides are changing here and not there. So let's go here. And change it here. Sweet. Okay. So I'm going to start out with uh, just a little overview of uh, the the talk that I hope to give today. Um, you know, an obvious place to start is is climate change um, and understanding what the future is going to look like for um, 
the the world globally, but but more specifically for for salmon um, aquatic ecosystems here in the, the Pacific Northwest and North America. Um, with that context in mind, we'll talk, I'll you know, sort of take a briefer, uh, a bigger overview of how our aquatic organisms respond to altered environments, um, and then get into sort of a high level overview of some of the genomic approaches um, that we have for studying organisms' responses to environmental change. And then I'm going to highlight a couple, you know, more specific examples um, of, of ways that genomics is used to predict climate change responses while highlighting our ongoing work in, in Chinook salmon. Um, and then uh, one of the things I kind of hope to do with this talk is also bring it a bit around and 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 not make this just here's some cool and science projects, but how do we see the work that we're doing um, actually, you know, being implemented in a, in a way that 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 alters sort of management and, and conservation of of these important species. So, uh, like I said, uh, a place to start is is looking at at sort of climate change like, like that global context. Um, and I think it should be no surprise to most of you in the room that, or the room, I'd say the room, the, the Zoom, um, that, uh, you know, human, um, human caused uh, increases in emissions of greenhouse gases have, have led to, uh, a, you know, contributed to a warming climate that we have. Um, and so in the figure here on the on the left hand side, um, we can see that the, the rise in, in emissions um, in the black solid line that that have, have occurred, uh, and looking forward toward the end of the century, um, there's a variety of scenarios that we might be faced with. And so, in the the red line is, is sort of um, what the International Panel on Climate Change uh, has identified as sort of a, a possible trajectory uh, under status quo. Um, and uh, I, I'll draw your attention to the fact that there's there's considerable um, amount of uncertainty in in what the future holds based on on how things change as we as we move into the future and whether additional policies are put in place or not um they've also sort of identified that 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 if we want to let limit warming to a a, a specific value uh, at global average that we need some pretty drastic reductions in in emissions um beyond those that that have been sort of currently committed to and so what, um, while this is sort of reflecting what greenhouse gas emissions look like, how does that map on to predicted, you know, sort of climate futures? Um, and the, the figure on the right here sort of shows a, a variety of scenarios uh, from less warming to more warming, where these, these two one and a half and two degree Celsius look, you know, relatively less uh, impacts um, where the, the chain, the magnitude of the, the colors here indicates the degree of change uh, in, in various things. The, the status quo probably is we're looking at something like a three degree increase, self, three degrees Celsius increase globally in, in, in temperatures. And these kinds of impacts, I think, again, most of you hopefully are, are familiar with the, the, the high level sort of things where we're going to see increased temperatures. We're going to see changes in in patterns um, of precipitation, and these uh, both are going to have impacts on on aquatic ecosystems. So, more specifically, with, with aquatic ecosystems in the Pacific Northwest, we've to date seen um, sort of warming in the, in the order of about a degree and a half Celsius, um, or for for our American colleagues, a two and a half degrees, uh, two to three degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and we're seeing changes uh, around precipitation, more coming as rain, less coming as snow. This has impacts on snowpack in the mountains. This affects runoff and sort of the availability and, and, and summer temperatures of, of, of um, changes in flow and, and changes in temperature. We're also seeing increased frequencies in, in extreme weather events. Um, and in the ocean, we're seeing uh, warmer conditions leading to in, in part to algal blooms and other, you know, uh, interacting stressors in, in those environments. And so um, what this means sort of in, in stream environments, there's been some nice modeling work um, that's, that's come out of Josephine Icarella's uh, group here at, at DFO um, for a variety of, of streams across British Columbia and sort of under, under less severe sort of emission scenarios um, we're expecting by the end of the century at least a couple of degrees warming in streams, but um, under more extreme 
scenarios as much as, as six or, or, or even closer to eight degrees Celsius, um, possible increases in temperature. Um, and so some of these things like more northern systems um, might be getting, you know, the absolute temperatures might then be getting up closer to 20, but for, for, for lower uh, Fraser streams, um, for instance, that are already sitting close to 20 degrees, these, these are, are pushing into uh, temperature regimes that are, are stressful for salmon. And so how do species respond to changes in their environment? And this is sort of a very high level um, summary um, that the, the first thing is you're you're a mobile species and you don't like where you are, well, can you move? Um, and so things like rain shifts or, or changes in distribution might be the, the first means by which a, a, an organism or a species uh, can, can respond to, a, to an altered climate. Um, aquatic organisms often have a limitation in that they have to live in water and where water flows limits where they can distribute themselves. Um, and so when you're stuck where you are, um, one of the, the next thing that, that, that organisms might do is, is mount in sort of an acclimation response. And so this is no different than us if you're sitting in a room right now and the, the HVAC system is tuned a little too hot or a little too cold, you might start sweating or you might start uh, shivering in response to that. You know, aquatic organisms have these same kinds of, uh, well, not sort of the endothermic responses, but they have you know, physiological mechanisms that they can use to acclimate um, to, to conditions, but there are, there are limits within, a, within an organism to, to what they can acclimate to. And so when alter, you know, changes uh, occur outside the range of what organisms can acclimate to, some organisms die and, and some organisms might have the capacity to, to tolerate that. And, and at a population level, through generations, um, if this variation has a, has a heritable basis, you might see genetic adaptation to changes in, 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 um, in climate. And without going into a ton of detail about the theory behind this, you need to have some genetic variation um, and the rate of change needs to be, you know, uh, reflect the amount of genetic variation and the, and the, and the generation time of, of organisms to for, for populations to be able to adapt um, genetically and evolve to to be able to, to continue to tolerate the conditions in the place that they are. And if you exceed those limits, um, then we're leading to a final scenario um, on the right hand side, which is extirpation. Um, and so this is, you know, for, for, for certain species around the world, this is already certain circumstances where, where species um, are going locally extirpated in, in places as a, as, a, you know, as a result of, of changes in the climate. So uh, I'm going to take sort of a, a, a broad, if you take a broad sort of perspective or, or definition of genomics, genomics is kind of a word that's one of these words that, that gets uh, thrown around a lot to describe a lot of different things. So a, a broad sense definition of genomic approaches to a studying uh, organismal responses to, to, to environmental change um, includes things like transcriptomics, um, which is an, you know, an approach to, to studying or quantifying gene expression. Um, there's epigenomics, which uh, is you know, quantifying factors that, that live on and around the DNA that influence the ways that it's being expressed. Um, and uh, those things aren't changing the DNA sequence uh, itself, but they are um, altering the way that it's expressed. And then there's sort of more uh, narrow definition of genomics, which would just be the DNA itself and whether there are changes to the DNA sequence in, in populations over time. Um, and so while I study you know, lots of these kinds of things. The, the transcriptomics and epigenomics stuff tends to be more focused on studying acclimation responses. Um, and I'm not really going to focus on on anything, um, any work that we're doing in that area at the moment. I want to sort of take a more narrow view on the, the adaptive, you know, uh, genetic adaptation or evolution of uh, potential of populations. And that's using sort of that more narrow definition of, of genomics. Um, and with within that uh, context, there's, I lost my, okay, oh. um, within that context, there's sort of two broad um, types of analyses that, that have been conducted that, that we're actively involved in, in doing. 
And so I'll just give a little overview of them here, and then we'll go into a little bit more detail um, as I sort of talk about our ongoing work with Chinook salmon. So uh, the first of these is, is called a, a genomic vulnerability analysis or a genomic offset. Um, there's a bunch of different people call it a bunch of different things. And, you know, it's all, one, you know, sort of one in the same or, or a related family of approaches. Um, and the, the principle of this is to go out, collect genetic samples from locations, um, collect information about the climate in those, those, those uh, places and, and across the species range, and try and correlate the variation in the, the genetics or the, uh, of the organism with the, the climate variables that you can collect in the, the places that you sample them from. And then based on the sort of the associations between genes and the environment, um, you can project what the future environment is going to look like. And, and you can calculate sort of how much genetic change might be required to um, for that population to, to keep up with that genetic change and um, populations that are going to have to have more genetic change or might have a, a, a lack of, of genetic variation are going to be more vulnerable to, um, to that change that they might be faced with. The second um, sort of family of approaches is what I'm going to call adaptive trait loci. Um, and this is taking a different approach rather than linking the genetics with the climate variables. This is actually um, trying to identify traits of an organism um, that are useful or, 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 or associated with being able to tolerate warmed climate, so these kinds of things, um, and looking to link, link genetics with the specific trait variation that we have. Um, with these, these traits that we believe are going to be important um, to respond to, to altered climates. Um, and then characterizing variation across populations and, and whether populations have the necessary genetic variation that would be linked with the trait variation to, to adaptively respond um, to changed climate. So I'm going to start by sort of talking a little bit more about the genomic vulnerability analyses. And this is an approach that's been relatively, it's relatively new, uh, probably you know, the last really 10 years, but 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 ramping up more in, in the last five years, so to speak. And um, and it's been applied across, a, 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 you know, a, a broad set of taxa from um, various kinds of trees, plants, birds, um, and, and, and works really fairly well in a, in a terrestrial environment when you have sort of climate variation distributed across the landscape. And um, what the, the 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 figures that you're seeing here is a sort of an example of how um, the 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 outputs of that work is that once you've got a, a, a set of, of markers that are associated with um, the climate variables and you project those future um, scenarios, you can calculate an offset. Um, so how much you know the here the redder areas in these figures are indicating you know, the regions of these species range where they're going to have to have more genetic change to keep up with that changing environment. And so these would be the populations that might be considered to be more at, um, at risk as a result of climate change. So the one place where this has sort of been applied in, in, in salmonid fish um, so far is, is in Arctic char in, in Newfoundland, so it's in Eastern Canada. Um, and so they've the folks, uh, my colleagues with with Fisheries and Oceans. Um, so this was work led by my Kara Layton and, and Ian Bradbury's group and, and uh, at DFO and in the Maritimes. Um, so they pulled a whole series of Arctic char populations from sort of Arctic, subarctic, and 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 more temperate uh, areas, sort of the northern tip of Newfoundland, and um, collected a, a whole bunch of climate data um, as well and and. and essentially went through the process. And then the, the figure on the right hand side that you're seeing here with these different uh, four different thought figures are, are four different sort of potential severity of, of climate change um, projections at the, the end of the century. And so for all of the populations that they've identified there, each population sort of has a, has a, a like the magnitude of the color and the size of the circle are, are, are reflective of the, the relative vulnerability. And so not surprisingly, some of the, you know, under the more extreme scenarios, you have some of the southern populations are going to experience more warming and are likely at a greater risk of, of having uh, of impacts or, but 
um, you can see that also, for example, if we if we look here in this sort of transition area from blue to yellow, that there's certain populations even within close geographic proximity to one another um, that have very different sort of risk profiles. And so this could be um, sort of useful in, in prioritizing um, their conservation or management um, actions. And so we're in the process of doing similar work um, with Chinook salmon here in, in uh, on the Pacific coast. Um, our, you know, as uh, working for the Fisheries and Oceans Canada, like a lot of our focus is, is, is fairly heavily on Canadian populations. Um, but we do have sort of, uh, you know, existing sample collections that have been graciously shared by, by collaborators in, in the, uh, in Alaska and the, and, uh, Oregon and Washington, um, that sort of fill in the, the range that was necessary to, to, to predict, um, that sort of build the, the correlational models um, that are necessary. And so we've got, uh, you know, 48 populations that have sampled. Um, and we've been um, experimenting both with, with uh, high density genotyping by sequencing data, as well as some, some low coverage whole genome sequencing um, work. And so we have the basically generate uh, genomic data for samples from these populations. We can, summarize that variation um, using principal components analysis to sort of, you know, recapitulate the major known genetic groupings of Chinook salmon. Um, our data fit the known patterns very, very nicely. Um, and then once we have um, these, we, we go out and also collect, or collect, but acquire climate data for, for each of these locations. And so the, the current work that we've been doing is, is using um, an approach that's been, um, you know, well employed, employed uh, fairly broadly using bioclimatic variables extracted from the World Clim uh, database. So this is, you know, sort of spatial raster information that's interpolated between um, reflecting the past twenty years or so of uh, of, of climate very uh, of climate data. Um, and so the, the the there's a long list here. I don't expect anyone to actually read it. Um, but just to, to, to show you that there's a whole bunch of parameters um, that that can be sort of broadly grouped into either temperature variables or precipitation variables. Um, and uh, these kinds of things are often fairly highly redundant. And so one of our first steps is that we get the, the variation across the range for all of all of these sites. Uh, and then we try and summarize that to, can, you know, to, to diminish, you know, reduce the data set to, to improve the efficiency of the fit. Um, of our models, and so uh, you you can see here the, the the stronger yellow in these in these groups. This is sort of just the all the variables by all the variables and the correlation, you know. And so you can see blocks of variables that are highly correlated with one another. Um, and so we essentially try and retain information that's that's relatively independent, but we retain some you know a single temperature variable or a single precipitation variable um, as it as it makes sense. Um, to, to plug into these models. Um, and then the next sort of step uh, is using that, uh, using, uh, we're using a technique called redundancy analysis. We use that climate variation to explain the genetic variation among uh, our sites. And so essentially our, our sites are distributed in that, that you know, multi-dimensional space of, of the climate variables. Uh, and then we can find out um, essentially which of the SNPs. So I don't expect anybody to to to, to, to glean details out of these these figures, but the, the 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 point is that these are all of the each different point here is a different genetic marker um, that we have in the data set, and that some of them are driving the patterns that we see uh, here. And so we're interested in identifying which of the SNPs are driving the, the differences between our populations based on the, the different climates that they're expo exposed to. Um, and this information can be extracted and projected um, across the genome, um, and which is the, the larger figure that you're looking at on the right-hand side. So each of the different little panels is a, is a different chromosome in the Chinook salmon genome. Um, and then we can, based on which axes um, these SNPs are, are uh, you know, sort of associated with, um, can help us classify these SNPs as being, these are ones being influenced by precipitation. These are ones being more influenced by temperature. Um, 
and, um, and, and characterize the, 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 the regions of the genome that explain the differences in our populations based on the climates that they experience. And this is the sort of the basis of the genetic environment association analysis. That's the basis of the, um, uh, the sort of genomic uh, vulnerability analysis that we want to con conduct. Um, so that's, that's a, unfortunately, I wish I had more, you know, the, the final results of this work to, to show with you. Um, we are currently still in the process of increasing sample size and, and, and populations. We're also these, you know, the, the spatial data sets that we have are, are excellent, but they also have, have limitations. Um, and we, we know, for example, some of the, the, our colleagues in the, in the freshwater group have some better resolution, stream temperature predictions, and, and these kinds of things that we're hoping to, um, to collaborate to, to incorporate those um, those refined or, or higher quality um, variables uh, in our in our in our model. Um, obviously, once we've got all of these pieces in place, we're going to calculate the offsets, and then based on the number of markers that we're seeing associating with these kinds of things, we're you know that will feed into the feasibility of developing screening tools because um, one of the the, the challenges that we have is is um, that the you know the per sample cost for the work that we're doing now is relatively high we're not going to apply that to every population um, but if we find specific regions of you know uh, some sort of number of markers that we find as, as you know gives us a good prediction of um, to, to be able to calculate these offsets for other populations we want to be able to take and build a tool that can screen um, a wider suite of populations at a more reasonable cost. Um, and so while this is a, a really cool approach um, and we're excited to be to be implementing it, we're also aware of the fact that it has some some limitations. Um, and one of the, the sort of the, the two main ones is that first of all, we're only linking genes with environmental variation. We're not actually linking it with any you know trait very you know known trait variation within the organisms. And so this is both a you know sort of a strength and a weakness of the the technique at the same time. The other challenge is that these patterns reflect um, historical associations. So this is where what the climate's been, what the past evolution has led to. Um, and for anybody that's done a sort of a regression, any kind of regression analysis, um, you know that, you know, regression models are really decent at making predictions within the range of your very your, your data. But when you try to start predict, projecting um, uh, outside of the, the, the known range of your data, the, the very, you know, the, the um, uncertainty in those predictions um, be, can be, can become quite, you know, quite uh, variable. And so that's one of the challenges with these kinds of analyses is that we're, we're essentially calculating, a, a, you know, a, a correlations within a, the blue range, which is where we've been, but how well does that predict where, where we need to go? Um, and part of this is, you know, just uh, um, features of how genetic variation links to climate change and the complexities of that, that, that we model with relatively simple models. Um, uh, and so this isn't sort of a, a silver bullet approach. And so that's why we, we're taking sort of multiple um, uh, approaches or angles to, to, to investigate this question of, of the climate adaptability of, of, of salmon. So I'm going to shift gears and talk about one of these other approaches that we're taking. Um, so I, I'm kind of calling this one adaptive trait loci. Um, and so instead of linking climate change or ch climate variation directly to the genetic variation, we're now we're trying to, you know, hypothesize about what are the traits that should, you know, would be useful or necessary for organisms to survive in the face of, of, of changed climates. Um, and then looking for the genetic variants that, that predict variation in these traits. Um, and so there's, there's a number within this sort of family, there's a number of ways of approaching this, this problem. Um, and the, the example that's, you know, in the figure on the right hand side here is more of a classic, you know, quantitative or a quantitative trait loci mapping where you've got lines that you diverged for a, a number of, of, of generations. You do intentional crosses in a lab and um, and back crosses, and then you characterize markers across the genome while also characterizing the phenotype. Um, 
and testing us. This isn't, you know, this isn't work that we're actively involved in. We're using, you know, sort of similar approaches um, where we're comparing the genetic variation here to the genetic variation in, in this, you know, with known with populations that have known, you know, differences in in in, in phenotypes. And again, this is this is work that all is going to sort of build to. We figure out the markers that are linked to adaptive variation, and then can we screen a, a broader set of populations? Um, with that you know, reduced set of markers. So um, in terms of what are the you know, traits, and we have to use our crystal ball a little bit to, to try and, and, and figure out what are uh, important um, phenotypes or traits to, to look at in, in salmon. Um, as ectotherms, we know that their performance is, is you know, multiple measures of their performance is tied um, tightly to temperature. So for example, things like somatic growth, their metabolic rates, their, their speeds of movement, uh, egg viability, there's all kinds of things. They're, 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 they're critical, thermal maximum. All of these are, are, are functions of temperature. Um, and we know uh, that, you know, they're going, that these, these organisms are going to experience warmer temperatures, um, warm temperatures at various points in the life cycle have been, have been identified as, as limiting factors for for Chinook salmon and so we for the, the particular project that, that I'm talking about here um, we've we've chosen sort of thermal tolerance or thermal performance as uh, as a trait that we're, we're gonna uh, that we're interested in and so the work that I'm going to talk about here is a, is a project that we we've, we've we've called genomic tools for predicting climate change resilience in, in Chinook salmon this is this is work funded um, through genome BC and their Genomic Innovation for Regenerative Agriculture, Food and Fisheries program, which has an awesome acronym. Um, it boils down to giraffe. So whenever I talk about this project, I get to say that I'm more talking about my giraffe work and people look at me strange and go, don't you study salmon? Um, but the, the the point of this work is, you know, sort of in collaboration with, with Tim Healy, Trish Schulte and, and Dave Metzger at, at Tim's with, with, with uh, us at, at Fisheries and Oceans, but Dave and Trish are, are over at um, UBC. And um, the goal of this project is sort of got three deliverables. We've, we're screening Chinook salmon for thermal tolerance or performance um, using a technique called CT Max, which I'll, I'll detail in a little more uh, uh, in a slide or two. Um, the next is sort of using genomic techniques to quantify the genetic differences between tolerant and sensitive individuals that we've that we've uh, characterized that phenotype for, and then the final part of this work is to um, be able to deliver a, 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 a screening tool to um, to to apply to to a broader suite of populations. So. Um, the, the technique or the, the sort of the endpoint, the phenotype, the trait that we're, we're uh, assaying in this project is called critical thermal maximum. Uh, and for those that, that aren't familiar, um, this is a technique that, that we basically put fish in a tank. We heat the water up at a, at a very, at a constant rate. Um, and we stand there and, and wait and uh, we record the temperature that, that fish, individual fish, uh, lose equilibrium. So they basically um, lose coordination to the point that they are, uh, that they turn belly up, um, which is, is taken as a sort of an end point that if that is continued, they would lead to death. Um, we take them out of the tank right away. We put them back into to ambient water and they recover quite quickly from this. Um, and while this is sort of a very acute um, thermal uh, measure um, and is in itself not necessarily super relevant to the kinds of temperatures that it, you know fish experience in streams on a, on a normal basis um, it does it is a measure of sort of a thermal performance it has correlation with other metrics of of thermal performance and so we're, we're using it as a sort of a proxy for that because it's a it's something that we can assay a lot of fish for in, in fairly easy manner um, and we can you know be able to perform the, the kind of work that, that we're talking I'm talking about today. So um, for the, the purposes of our project, we, we chose four stocks um, from uh, from around 
the relatively close to the area, reflecting a variety of life history strategies. So we have um, two sort of ocean type or, or sub yearling releases from, from hatcheries in, in the Harrison River stock from Chehalis and the, the summer run of, of shrimp salmon at, at the Chilliwack uh, hatchery. Um, and then two more stream type or, or yearling uh, released fish uh, from Ashloe Creek and Shovelnose Creek um, that are uh, they're just up the road, just up the road from us here in West Van. And so we brought in um, 500 fish from each of these stocks. Um, we collected uh, sort of biopsy samples from them, and we individually tagged them so we could track them throughout the, the course of the experiment. And then we conducted CT Max in in both freshwater as a pre smolt stage. Um, and then uh, we, we allowed them to recover, we gave them a few weeks, we transitioned them to salt water uh, as, as they were smolting. We waited a, a few weeks for them to recover from that. And then we, we challenged them again um, with a CT Max in salt water. And so we can link sort of um, individual performance in freshwater with, with individual performance in, in salt water. Uh, and and whether it also investigate sort of whether the genetic basis is the same under under those two different environmental conditions. Um, and so for some sort of high level results, um, some interesting you know work uh, or interesting uh, results in, in in terms of the overall patterns of CT Max where uh, our um, stream type or, or or yearling fish consistently have a lower slightly lower CT Max both in 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 freshwater and in salt water. Um, and that overall, um, the salt, the fish in salt water um, post smolts had tended to have a, a lower um, CT max than they did in, in freshwater. Um, and so while these are kind of interesting results um, and comparing, uh, you know, among populations wasn't really the goal of this work because we're not looking at which populations might survive better. What we're interested in um, is the individual variation in CT max. And that's part of the reason that we, we did so many fish. So the 500, doing 500 fish per stock, let us look at the distribution of CT max values within each population. So here um, in the figure on the left, we have each of our different populations as a different line um, with the individual CT max you know, values plotted sort of as the points underneath, um, and then the overall distribution with our sort of the density plot on the top. And um, like I said, uh, the, the point of this work is actually because we're interested in sort of the top 10% and the bottom 10% of these fish, because these are the, the top 10% uh, fish are our more tolerant fish and our less tolerant fish are down here. And we wanna know is there genetic variation within these populations that predicts you know, high performance, low performance. And so the, the, the sort of methodological approach for this is that we're gonna take the DNA um, and use a, a technique called pool seek. So instead of sequencing each individual, which tends to be quite expensive, um, we're, and we're, because we're only interested in, in the, the, the sort of the variance that segregate between those two groups, we can just take equal amounts of DNA from all the individuals in the top 10%, pool it together, sequence that as one sample, and do the same thing for the, the bottom 10%. And then we can use the, the, the resulting data to calculate the, the allele frequency differences between the top and the bottom percent and identify the regions of the genome. Um, you know, as, as you know, again, like there would be as an example here, the, the, the points in red on, on this Manhattan plot um, that uh, the, these are the, the, the sort of the SNPs that are associated with that variation in, um, in, in thermal performance, um, which are the, the markers that would feed into our model. And so again, this is very much in, in progress work. The, the pool seek data for these top, uh, for the, the, the performance just came in uh, for between four and six weeks ago. And so the, the Dave, the, the research associate on the project is, is busy churning through that data. Um, and so completing the, the analysis is the, is the kind of thing that we're hoping to complete in the next few weeks. Um, and um, in, there's a, a sort of a prioritization exercise that we're going to go through with um, choosing, you know, reducing that that set of SNPs down to a, a reasonable number that can be fit into a, a low density tool to a, so a, a couple of hundred SNPs, let's say. Um, and so part of that work is, is sort of other work that Dave has on the go using some of those other types of 
broader sense, genomic data, omic data, so transcriptomic and epigenomic data to, to, to say, you know, look at gene expression responses in these fish as well as, as, as changes in the epigenome um, that will help us prioritize SNPs that are in these regions that are also changing expression of, of other factors. Um, and so once we have these, um, these markers, um, the, 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 the rest of the work in the next six months is to, to test um, and validate that tool. Um, by essentially screening uh, additional populations, seeing whether those the variation for the same SNPs exists across these other um, across a broader suite of populations. And so, on the shift uh, gears, uh, well, not so much shift gears, but I just want to go beyond sort of the the the, la the lack of final results that we have, but talk about how and and where this kind of data um, is going to you know where we see this going or where we see this take uh, this this these approaches um, impacting changes in management and and uh, and or conservation and so i i would say i, I think a good example of uh, i want to highlight first a, an example of where genomic tools have been applied genetic and genomic tools have been applied to fisheries management in, in meaningful ways and that's uh, something that that folks may or may not be familiar with on the call but is is um, been referred to as parentage-based tagging. And so uh, just as you might uh, guess, uh, parentage-based tagging is, is using a genomic tool to be able to assign a particular fish to its parents genetically. And so this is something that's fairly easy to implement in, in hatchery environments um, because you can handle, you can collect genetic samples from all of the fish that are used as, uh, in, in the brood. Um, and so that effectively tags 100% of the fish that are being reared in that particular hatchery. And so um, in context where there are hatchery stocks that are being used for, for assessment, so the, old, uh, the, the standard way of doing this for, for decades has been to use coded wire tags, which is a little piece of metal that gets punched into the nose of fish um, that are released. Um, at a certain frequency, so let's say it's 10% of, of the releases of a stock, and those fish are are then recovered in, in fisheries or in, in, in other contexts and used to understand, you know, where fish are, are going, um, what are the exploitation rates on, on various stocks and, and these kinds of, th kinds of things that have fed into models that have improved the management of, of salmon um, over the years. And so there's been a push, at least in, in, you know, I think on both sides of the board, I think it's more, I don't understand all the work that's gone into it because it's a little bit outside of my um, realm, but but here in Canada, we've we've certainly pushed the use of parentage-based tagging um, within a Canadian context to to improve the management of, of hatchery uh, brood stocks, and also as a, a complement um, potential replacement for some of the coded wire tagging work that that's going on here. And so we actually have a hundred, nearly hundred percent of our coho and chinook salmon broods that are that are are tagged, um, to my knowledge at least. And so the, the, the idea that we have, um, you know, in, in, in support of all of this, there's, there's sort of infrastructure that's been built up around how do we go from samples in the field to a usable data product. And, and so there's the, the, the molecular genetics lab um, at the Pacific Biological Station in Nanaimo has, has really whole, you know, refined a process um, to collect Tin, fin tissues, extract the DNA, amplify this, this specific set of markers that are used in this tool. They prepare it, they sequence it, and then they have the, 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 the data analysis pipelines to, to generate the parentage assignments and disseminate those, that information to the, to the end users um, for you know, influencing uh, the, you know, various kinds of, of, of management actions. And the idea with what um, some of the climate change work that we were doing is, is to build a similar tool that could run through a similar type of pipeline um, and that would feed into sort of future predictions. So if we have a suite of markers that, that are associated with climate, so this could be you know, fed through the genomic variability, vulnerability analysis, through you know the the, the adaptive trait loci work um, that we build a, a collective panel that we can then go out 
And rather than hundreds of dollars per sample, we're talking about $25 per sample that we can go and screen a lot more populations um, to generate prediction you know, estimates of, of where that population um, could be in the future, how how resilient it might be, how how imperil it might be, um, and these kinds of this kind of information and vision being useful for prioritizing conservation actions, and so that could go from, you know, figuring out which ones are most at risk that we need to put effort into, or in you know in 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 worst case future scenarios where we're triaging, um, and we can look at it and say, look, this population, uh, it has no hope uh, based on the future predicted scenarios, there's nothing we can do to recover that population. Instead of investing there, this other one has hope. And that perhaps that we 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 focus our efforts there, um, you know, in, in preserving salmon where we can if if that's the kind of scenario that we we end up in. Um, the other kinds of, of 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 application of this sort of tool would be a monitoring through time. And that's one of the one of the key uncertainties, I think, in in terms of you know, adaptive responses to climate change is whether the genetic change can keep up with the environmental change. And so having a tool that can monitor genetic change through time uh, at a relatively inexpensive um, amount would allow us to go in at a certain frequency and measure is the population responding in a timely fashion, are they keeping up? Um, and, and so for monitoring that, that change in, in diversity through time. And so um, with that, I would like to acknowledge uh, the small army of people that have contributed to this work, um, all of the, the techs in, in my group, um, the, oh, of course, I missed, I'm gonna highlight Dion Sakrani, who name does not make it on here, but should definitely be on here in my group, um, that, uh, that have contributed to all the phenotyping work that we've done, uh, our, our funding agencies, um, the, the the molecular genetics lab in, in, in Nanaimo that's that's done a lot of the, the, the work um, producing the data that we, that I'm presenting today, um, and highlight the, the the Pacific Salmon Strategy Initiative for the sort of the funding um, that's supported a, a good chunk of the the genomic vulnerability analyses. Um, and I'd be happy to take any questions that folks have. Thank you, Kyle. Excellent, um, informative presentation there from, I think the last time I took a genetics course, I was in like fourth year university. So I, I'm playing catch up, but I definitely, it was still <laughs> for, for the, uh, for the uneducated, this was still, it still made a lot of sense and learned some new, um, uh, processes that you guys are working on. So we do have about 10 minutes for questions. Um, Gary Moshimur, Mosh, I'm going to say it wrong, Gary, but is actively um, putting some conversations in, in the chat, including, um, you know, how this works with related to like Sara listed species and things that were uh, required to have species recovery plans at. I think he's renamed those. So Gary, I'm not sure if you had a specific question that we were trying to get through to Kyle, but um, I'll sort of paraphrase one of his other ones is that how this might come into play for genetic engineering and hatcheries and hatchery populations um, as we're sort of responding to projected trends in, in climate change. Oh, I just lost it there. Scrolling back down, trying to read what Gary wrote. No face okay. change, sorry. Yeah, no, uh, it's, a, it's a good question. So in, 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 in case, uh, in our case, I don't think we, Somebody can correct me. I'm not sure that we have, we don't have any sort of Sarah listed Chinook salmon populations in Canada that I'm aware of. Somebody can correct me. Um, but yeah, no, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a good question. And it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a dicey one in the sense that when there are legal obligations to maintain things um, and not letting nature take its course. Um, I think that, you know, if I'm looking at how you would apply this and under those kind of, you know, contexts, I think there, you'd, you'd be looking at um, what are the variation, what's the variation that you might need to keep that population under the predicted scenario that you might have in that place. And so if you're looking at uh, bringing in sort of genetic variation from somewhere else, so, you know, you're, you're, inter, you're interbreeding, 
perhaps it would be a would introduce its own set of challenges because then you're you're disrupting that natural um, you're in you know it, it, the 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 locally adapted the other locally adapted genetics so you might run into other issues under the ESA um, type thing and then you know if you're actually going in there with with CRISPR to try and change variants. Um, you certainly would, you'd have, you could use the information generated in the tools that we're trying to develop to know what the variation should be changed to. Um, but it's also, it's a tricky one because there's challenge, multiple challenges on, on, on the other side of things, whether you're looking at, you know, off target effects that you might have because of CRISPR public perception, because of the use of, you know, genetic engineering tools or the, you know, degrading the, um, you know, the, the, the native genetic signature by him trying to breed in the variation you need to preserve that very population. And these are, these are t real, real tough conversations that, um, the fun part of being a scientist is I get to talk about the science and I don't, I don't have to make the decisions. Um, you guys are policy people. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this, yeah. Is, this is it. But I, I mean, I mean, those are, you know, those are, you know, they're, they're, important considerations that that have to be weighed by multi-stakeholder groups in those contexts yeah no no thanks for that Kyle. and I, I think the only chinook sound population is in the okanagan that is currently being is open for consultation for listing i don't believe it's officially listed yet but could get there so someone else can fact check that but i, I think that's where we land yeah. um we had another question about the ct max trials with the 500 um fish per population um, individual fish in a tank, 2000, I, I, I sort of know the answer, but maybe you could just give a little bit yeah. of a description of the experimental design no. for, for Adrian and others. No, it's good. Thanks, Adrian, for the, it's a good question. Um, so yeah, when we did this, it would, just, it was, it's, I think it's close to, what is it? Five, eight. Yeah. So it's 4,000, there's 4,000 data points in the, in the, in the whole data set, or it's just shy of that. Cause like you, you, you lose a few fish here and there. Um, we did them basically a uh, hundred at a time. So each stock, there would have been 10, uh, sorry, five trials for one stock in each water. Temp um, so the fish were held in a large, you know, about 4,000 liter tanks. Um, and then we would net, you know, we would net a hundred of them out to do a trial and then they would get put into a separate tank. And so the, the nobody was done more than once. Um, but there is a, there were, you know, we, we controlled for, for batch effects, corrected for batch effects to, to the best of our abilities, um, with, uh, with that data set. And so for, for anybody that's done CT max, um, it's one of these things where it's a very slow start and then everything goes haywire for about 10 minutes and then it's done. Um, and for, for us having the fish, um, individually pit tagged, you know, several weeks before we started the trial, it was actually very, you know, effect effective because the fish turned over. We had essentially had a team of three people netting one person running a pit tag reader that was linked to the computer. And so the fish just came out, got scanned and went right into the recovery bath. And so we already had length and, uh, and individual information for them. And so it was just as a matter of scanning them when you have to like get the length information as you're going, it's would not have been tractable to do it a hundred at a time. Even, even with a hundred at a time, it was, it was a little hairy at, at times, but yeah. Yeah, no, no, I, I, <laughs> I, I remember walking by when that experiment was underway and yes, it's very busy. And normally CT maxes are done in small, like glass aquarium sizes with, you know, like 10 fish. So that is, it is quite different to see it on that volume. And they're on that, really only yeah. able to do that because of the genomics capacity. So. Yeah, um, yeah so, we... so we've only got two minutes left so i'm just going to use this time as a thank you for kyle we really appreciate you uh coming and sharing if any of you guys want to get in touch with kyle with any more detailed research questions it's just first name decimal last name at dfo dash mpo I, i'll put it in the chat for people to read yep. but um, you can track him down um our next salish sea uh, science roundtable is on november 5th um, so that will be starting at the standard time, 12.30 to 1.30, and it's going to be uh, Melissa Foley and Alicia Gilbreth. 
um, talking about the San Francisco Estuaries Institute Next Generation Urban Greening Efforts. So um, this, I, what I love about this roundtable is there's such a range of different topics that we've been covering um, and yeah, lots of stuff to learn about. Perfect. Thanks, Sandra, for putting that up. Um, so yeah, thank you everyone for joining today. Feel free to get in touch um, and share the link with other people that may be interested in attending our next one and much appreciate you joining us today. Thanks so much, everybody.